Mr. Minicuzzi, welcome to the Ways and Means Committee. We're looking forward to hearing your presentation today. Well, thank you, and thanks for having me. So let me just, if you don't mind, I'll just go ahead and share screen. Um, I sort of talk in pictures. Um, and if you could start by introducing yourself for the record, we'd appreciate that. Uh, certainly. For the record, my name is Joe Minicozzi. I'm principal of a company um, called Urban3 based in Asheville, North Carolina. Uh, we're, we're known as a real estate economic an analytics firm. Uh, my background is, uh, I actually grew up in upstate New York. Um, my brother went to, to school in Rutland, and um, I went to University of Miami undergraduate um, for architecture and then Harvard for graduate degree in urban design with a concentration in real estate development. I've worked in a municipal, a real estate finance, uh, city planning at a municipal level for, for government, but also in the private sector. And now I have this economics firm, but the economics firm is a, uh, is a spinoff of a real estate development company here in Asheville. Uh, where, where uh, I used to work. We're actually still in their office. It's a for-profit real estate development company called Public Interest Projects. And Julian Price uh, basically started the company with $15 million of, of investment into real estate. So 75% of that $15 million went into buildings, and then we reserved 25% to start businesses up. Now, our time was the direct opposite. We spent more of our time with the businesses and less of the time with the buildings. Once you fix a building, it pretty much moves along its way. But what we were doing was coming into a city that was uh, basically mothballed and stripping off the old aluminum siding and making places for people to live. Uh, these are small apartments above a, a bookstore. So this is just economic revitalization of a city. But one of the things that really struck me was how we communicate here. Um, one is we talk about land as a product. Uh, think of the way that farmers talk about land. They're talking about crop yield. Um, labor per, per acre, water per acre, all of it's an economic term. So if we're to go back to one of our buildings, this is a building that we rehab and we did ground floor retail, second floor office and upper stories residential. The city invested in the streetscape project. Now, I'm not, not, not making this up. This is Appalachia down here. And folks accused us of being criticized or, or subsidized for the city doing this $20,000 sidewalk improvement. $20,000 would be in front of our door, but they did the whole streetscape project. Great. We took the tax value from 300,000 to 11 million. So when we talk to folks in the community, we're like, I understand you think we're subsidized, but realize we just increased the tax base on this property by 3,500%. So this produces 3,500% more taxes. Go out and buy 3,500% more bike rack. Don't care. You know, do you have a 401k plan that grows by this? And it really kind of confused me that like, we should be talking about our cities in economic terms. And there are these biases that people have. And they're like, well, hey, Joe, that's fine. That's $11 million. We have this Walmart at $20 million. That's double the value if you just take it on face value. But it's really not a fair way of looking at it because that Walmart consumed 34 acres of our farm versus our 0.2 acres of our building. So that's an apples and oranges comparison. So rather than do that, let's look at the tax yield per acre. We're producing 100 times more property taxes double the retail taxes. Who would have thought that a furniture store, a tattoo shop, and a beauty salon are double the production of a Walmart? But they are. Uh, obviously, more residents than a Walmart and more jobs. So any way you slice this, it's better for a community to have that Main Street building than it is to have the suburban building. And yet the reason why we're getting the opposite is because we can't see that it's actually undermining our economic system. It's happening because it's basically we're charging it less. Um, so I would argue that we don't look at this because we don't see it in a certain way. So if, if let's kind of step out and use a metaphor, if I can show you your brain, we can go into the doctor, I can show you your brain stem activity in blue versus your creative thought processes in green. I can show you what's going on inside your head. Can we show our community? So this is my county, um, Buncombe County. Uh, I've got two voters out in the county for every one voter in the city. Uh, politically, uh, they a lot of folks out in the county don't like the city. Um, they got our state legislator to call us a cesspool of sin, which is super awesome. Um, but if you look at this, this is non-taxable. Uh, this is Mount Mitchell Federal Park. This is Pisgah Forest. So just to be crude about it, it's non-taxable. I don't care about it. It's not paying me taxes. It's just a big park. So you'll see on the key up here, I graded out it, it non-taxable. Low value is green. This area up here is called uh, Big Ivy. It's all low value. 
And then down here in purple is super valuable. So this is the Biltmore estate, that big purple splotch right there. The Biltmore oh. estate is the is the Vanderbilt mansion. It's the America's largest house. That one house is worth $100 million. That's cool. But who's got a house on 8,000 acres of land and the house is 180,000 square feet? No one, you know? So it's like, that's not really a fair way of looking at it because it's like, imagine talking about miles per tank basis. It's like, yeah, it's a different size tank. So rather than total value, here's value per acre. And let's just not stop there. Let's look at that in 3D. So when I talk to my peers and cousins or whatever out in the county, people in Fairview, let's say, people in Fairview think they're paying a lot of taxes, but they have no idea what we're paying in downtown taxes to the same county. So I know the counties are different up there, but it's still think of this in relative terms about productivity. What I'm showing you here is you don't have to guess where downtown Asheville is. And our city is only 90,000 people. Look at how productive our downtown is compared to everything else around it. But also another lesson here is look 10 miles to the east. This is a little village of Black Mountain. Black Mountain's about 13,000 people. It's a traditional little downtown. And you can see it's a little downtown popping up. So the old ways of which we built cities are actually way more productive than the new forms of urbanism that we build today. If you look on the south side, this is all new city down here. And you can see how low value that is. So our attitude is like, okay, that, that's fine. That's the reality of the economics. I'm just going to show you what's going on. I don't, I don't want to talk about it. It's just look at the data. And if this is good for you, great. You know, it's, it's just, how does it look? So for us to do this, what we do is we typically, we grab all of your information. We're actually working in Burlington right now on their tax system. We're going to sort out all of this data. It's, it takes some, some work to do that. This is the majority of the work actually to make the work communicate. Then we, we go back and forth with our clients to say, okay, how does, what do you see here? What do we see? Let's talk about it. But ultimately when it goes to the citizens, we need to present it in a way that they understand it. Most people speak in stories. So it's just, what's a narrative? Who are you as a community? How do you function economically? So our thesis is bring the community, the information uh, in an economic way, but also allow them to see the stuff in a very transparent way. I'll give you one final example on this before we get into uh, land value taxation. In Eugene, Oregon, the community was considering changing its growth boundary. And we said, well, before you do that, understand how you function. So here's their, here's their cash flow, if you will. This is the money coming out of the ground. Oregon has no retail taxes, so this is it. This is how the city functions financially. You can pretty much tell where downtown is in this model. It's not magic. There are a couple of things that are failures on how cities operate in an economic way. And you can, you can all can talk with your finance officer at any town or city, but they follow a standard of municipal finance where they list roads and pipes and all of that as assets. Let that wash over you for a second. In my business, my computer is an asset. If, if we had delivery vans, those are assets. Or if we had a piece of real estate, those are assets. I can sell you the building, the truck, or the computer. Can, can Rutland pick up its streets and sell them to Burlington? No. You know, so those are fixed liabilities. And you have to look at that differently. So from a cash flow standpoint, your municipalities are operating a little bit blind because they're thinking these things are assets but really they're ongoing liabilities. So the way to flip your mindset from that financially into a liability in real estate terms, if, if I own a mall as a pension fund or something like that, that's my asset. On that asset, I have these things called air conditioners that have to be replaced every so often. So usually every 20 years, I have to replace air conditioners. They're not cheap. In a mall, they're gonna be $85,000 a pop plus I need $35,000 for the sky crane and the crew, right? So that's money that I need to squirrel away. I need to save out of rent to every 20 years pay for that air conditioner. So what I need to do is find a way to make $205,000 in this building to be able to pay for maintaining that, that liability, right? So if you do the same thing for the city and say, okay, let's just, we can figure out what you own. We know what kind of pipes you have. We know the useful life of a pipe and a road and a sidewalk and everything else. So you should be a, a, a bean in its, every own, in its own pot. You should understand how to float your city. So here it is floating in a lake. Um, what's above the water line is the money coming out of the ground. What's below the water line is the cost in the ground. So think of this as floating in a lake and looking at the side view of a boat. This is how we did the visualization of this. And so if you live out here, awesome. I don't care, that's your choice. 
That's what you pay in taxes. But we as a community need to understand this is what you cost society for your lifestyle choice. If you can afford that, awesome. But you should be aware of that subsidy that's baked into the system. So when you net your revenue against your expense, this is what's net positive is in black. What's net negative at a community level is in red. Here's the top of the model. And you can see how downtown is crushing it. Um, if you lift this model up, like you're looking for a salamander under a rock, this is what the spread of subsidy looks like across the model. And this is the truth of your data. It's like, sorry, this is the way you are. Now, when they saw this, they realized that their growth boundary wasn't the issue. Their current waste inside the land that they used was inefficient. So they changed their policies because of that. So they also changed their attitude about their growth boundary. They didn't expand it. So breaking the city down, again, giving the citizens an idea of what it is. Uh, we made this simple slide. We call it the Brady Bunch slide. Um, it's our inside joke, but basically you have your residential properties, low density, medium density, high density, mixed use, low, medium and high, commercial, low, medium and high. These are actual buildings in their community and these are the sticker prices. So the single family detached house that basically we all live in has a massive subsidy tied to it. So let's just be honest with the citizens and show them what it is. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. You would choose that product if you give that subsidy. Awesome. People want houses, but can you afford 80% of your land use in subsidy? And the answer is no, they can't. So our recommendation to them wasn't to say, you know, people in single family houses are evil or to tax them more or any of that. It was like, find other options. So definitely prioritize doing stuff downtown. Definitely. You need to shift your money over there to capitalize, to get more net benefit, to be able to support your neighborhoods. Secondly, if you look up here at this area called Crescent Village, you can see this little foothill up there on the north of the model. So, you know, find four more places in your community to do that. You know, get policies out of the way that are hampering infill development and if find a way to make the, the black stuff easier to do. So in their case, they shifted their um, impact fees. They removed the impact fees in, in the bus corridors and along the transit lines to incentivize infill development. Again, this isn't to say that everybody needs to live in this type of development, but it's to realize that type of development is actually net positive and you should try to get more of that. Also, there's a market for it. So I would argue that if you can't see the leaks in your system, you can't fix them. If you, I can't see where the holes are in the bucket, I can't patch it. One fine detail on this before I close Eugene, and this is not too terribly sexy to talk about, but this is kind of what we see in cities is like the sewerage system. So when we were talking with the engineer, we made this map. Every one of these different colors is its own trunk system of the sewer. So you can just go ahead and pull out any one of those colors and you would see it, it could stand on its own. And when I asked the engineer, I said, when everybody flushes their toilet, do they all pay the same cost for sewerage per gallon? And he said, yes, that's fair. And I said, okay, so this this neighborhood up here has eight of these pink things. Those pink things are lift stations. How much is a lift station? And he said a million dollars a pop. And I said, how much does it cost to fix those? It's like $50,000 a year, right? That's what it costs you. So, so this neighborhood up here has $20 million of extra infrastructure that no other neighborhood has. Why would you give that subsidy to them? And he was just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't, I didn't do a subsidy. I'm like, that's how you priced it. You know, let's just be honest about that. And let's be honest to the community that that's the cost of that one neighborhood. Now, to be honest with you, they should have never built that neighborhood there in the first place because they built it in a wetland and it's super expensive to lift your sewerage out of a wetland. You know, you could have just had environmental standards and, and done that. But anyway, this is the cost that they have in the system. So our attitude whenever we do this analysis is, I, I call it geo-accounting. We're gonna be like an accountant. We're just gonna put the numbers on a map, see what happens, show and visualize the patterns so people can see it. So there is data that's out there. We're all swimming in a wash in data, but you have to find a way to see the patterns that are making things happen. And that's our argument for using GIS technology to do this. Now on a land value taxation, a lot of people talk about land value taxation um, in, a, in a way that it's sort of ephemeral. This is, this is some, it's like a, like a Mars landing to go to land value taxation. But actually in the 1800s, there was a tax economist, his name was Henry George, um, who was thinking that our current tax system in 1800s was, in, was inequitable. It also incentivized people to waste land. 
So you could be, you know, your family stepped off the Mayflower in Boston, that you could be the Copley family and just sit on the land forever. Meanwhile, we have all of this problem of, of development and housing. So you could speculate and actually the cost of that pipe, the road, everything else, if you don't build on your land, the rest of the community picks up that cost because you're being taxed on present value. That's not fair. A lot of people it's, it, thought this was groundbreaking in 1880. <laughs> and uh, there was con conventions on it. It was called the uh, the land value tax or the Henry George system. There was conventions that they have all across the country. Elizabeth Maggie Phillips was a Georgist and she believed in the system. And she also understood humans. And she's like, people get too set in their ways. It's hard for them to change. So I'm gonna teach children land value taxation. By the way, I love her eyebrows. But putting that aside, she made she made this board game to teach us land value taxation. Do you all recognize the game? Yeah. It's Monopoly. So it's like, look, we learned this as kids, that location matters, land assembly is important. And when you put a building on it, that's how you win the game. The same is true for cities. So I could go into, into, you know, into downtown Burlington and find a surface parking lot that's privately owned. That person is only taxed on how they use the land. It's not taxed on the latent value in the land or the cost of the police car and garbage truck going by. That's not fair. So just be honest with people. Um, we do find in more sophisticated cities, there is some form of that. So this is uh, Hennepin County, which is um, Minneapolis. So we, we visualize their, their, their property tax model. We visualize their retail tax model. It was kind of fun when we did this in a lot of states, like this is actually illegal to do in North Carolina. We're not allowed to look at this data, which is crazy, but here's, here's downtown's retail tax production versus Mall of America. That's awesome. When we did their stripping the buildings off the land and just looking at the land value per acre, this is just dirt. So land value per acre, here's its 3D model. There are a couple of things going on here that was kind of interesting. One is look at this little town out here called Wayzata. Wayzata is like 10,000 people. This is Minneapolis over here. And when you zoom in, downtown Wayzata is pulling the dirt value of, of Minneapolis, which is kind of insane. The other thing you can see is the consistency that the, the, the assessor uses. You can see clearly where there's a zoning break between one neighborhood and another because the land value changes. That's fair and appropriate. But when I was showing this to one of the planners in Minneapolis, I mean, the guy was such a nerd. He goes, hey, Joe, you just visualized the tax code change of 1988, blah, blah, blah. I was like, what, what, what are you talking about? And he said, up until 1988, you couldn't have private lakefront real estate. These are the land of the lakes in, in Minnesota. Lakes had to be publicly accessible, but we changed that law in 1988. And you see over here in Wayzata, there's a crust of value that's all around the edges, which seems logical, right? You have lakefront access. The value of the lake doesn't disappear. It just slides to the beachhead. Cool. But if you notice the neighborhood, the neighbor right on the other side of that property, the land value drops precipitously because they don't have lakefront access. Yet look over here. In this neighborhood, you have two lakes. Both of those lakes have greenways around the lakes. There's a public park. This neighborhood was set up in the 1920s previous to this law change. And you see the value of the entire neighborhood has spread into, or the value of the lake has spread into the neighborhood, like, a, like an aircraft carrier. It's the same kind of height, which is a very valid way of looking at land value. That whole neighborhood has access to the amenity. Mm -hmm. So your communities can operate with this level of sophistication if they are thinking. The technology is there to do this. Um, at, at an extreme end, when you think of land value taxation, we've done work in New Zealand and, uh, and uh, Australia, both of them operate off land value taxation and it drives change in land behavior. So you see that they're, they're a lot more dense in the way that they think about their land. Even the in-town neighborhoods are denser than a typical American neighborhood. And there's an exact translation into the valuation in the city that's a reciprocal financial relationship. So places are hundred years ahead of us on thinking this stuff through. This is a different shot of the model. You can see the transit corridors and the value of them coming out. So there's a there's a relationship between the value that they put into the land and the return on that. And just to show you the idea of their thinking, when they saw this model, actually it was this one here, they wanted to know about, uh, where is it? There's like a saddle right here, this big hole, this divot. Well, with, with that is, is a highway interchange that's sort of obsolete. There's a new highway built over here. 
And they immediately thought about land recycling. They're like, well, we've wasted all of this real estate with DOT stuff. Let's just put that back into the system. So what would happen if we took all of this yellow land that's currently all right of way and put it back into the taxable basis? So they asked us to run that and that model. Now, Auckland is sort of like Boston. It's, it's sort of this economic machine on steroids at this point. If you do nothing, you're going to see value change. So we, we went and filled it in that hole right there. And this is, if you do nothing, you're going to get money. It doesn't matter what you do, but if you fill in the hole, you're going to get more money. So we calculated that over 15 years. So their tax system, they call taxes rates there. These are the rate growth if you do nothing. And this is if you fill in the hole, it's pretty obvious, but this is new wealth that they get. This is the kind of modeling that you, um, there's other states that are in, in the United States that, that have different forms of taxation. This is Kansas City, Missouri, because they're on the border with Kansas, they actually charge what well, they charge. This is property tax model. This is the retail tax model. Um, this is the income tax model. They actually charge income tax for people in Kansas City, Missouri, if they work there, but live in Kansas, uh, over in Johnson County in Kansas. So it's a lot of border states do this. Ohio does this in Cincinnati. So I just want to maybe use these examples to stretch your mind a little bit and realize that Moses didn't deliver us our tax system. It's fairly antiquated. And these are systems that can change. And just to show you the lunacy that we find in the tax system on how assessors currently operate, this is Cheyenne, Wyoming. And just looking at the, the land value per acre, you see this neighborhood up here that's all blue in the upper left. You, you expect the world to operate that way. Everybody in the neighborhood is the same value per acre. But when I was presenting this to the assessor or to the community, I said, what's going on here where this land right here is blue and when you cross the street, it turns orange. So it goes from 15,000 to 30,000 just for the dirt, doubles in value when you cross the street. I said, how is that? Now the room was silent and the assessor raised her hand and she goes, no, 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 you don't understand. I'm like, what am I missing? And she goes, well, these people over here have more land. Now, remember, there's no buildings in this in this valuation. It's just dirt per acre. And, and she goes, these people have more land. The more land you have, the lower the value. I'm like, really? I get more of your property? You give me a discount? And by the way, the mayor the mayor laughed and almost spat coffee out of his nose when I said that. I'm like, so I get, I get more of your land and you're going to give me a discount. She goes, yeah, that's our standard. And I said, so... I've got three miles of road around here. This fellow has got 200 feet. You don't charge me for all that road. She goes, no, it's not part of our valuation. That's not the way we look at our system. I'm like, so you don't care about how much money you spend on me. She goes, no, that's not our standard. And she just kept on saying it's our standard. And it, like the, the, all the politicians are freaking out because I'm showing like exactly how they get undermined and the assessor couldn't see it. And so I actually took this presentation to the International Association of Tax Assessing Officers Conference their magazine is called Fair and Equitable. And I asked them, how is this fair and how is it equitable? To their credit, they said, it's not. <laughs> I'm like, you agree with this? They're like, yeah, we probably need to change that. You should go talk to Larry. I'm like, Larry who? They're like, Larry Clark. I'm like, really? I only have to talk to one guy? I, I showed this to Larry and he's like, yeah, we probably need to change that. You, you all are trying to run a government and you have these kind of judgment calls going on and it undermines your financial system. So just, just be mindful of that, that how do you visualize that and show that? Um, to show another example, and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap, start to wrap it up here. This is Charleston, South Carolina. Charleston is like the South version of Boston. This is their three county metro model, um, very old place. So we just focused on grabbing all the buildings that predate the Declaration of Independence. So we know when that birth date happened, they have colonial buildings. Uh, this is one here that was built in 1686. It's the oldest liquor store in the entire United States. Although for 20 years, it wasn't called a liquor store, but we'll put that aside. Um, this building is pulling $13 million of value per acre. The Walmart is pulling about 800,000 per acre. So let that wash over you for a second. A building built 400 years ago is that much more productive than a Walmart. Here it is. Here are all the old buildings that, that predate the Declaration of Independence in the model. Now, stripping the buildings off, they've impregnated the soil with a certain amount of value because the assessor can't logically say that this little wooden stucco building is a replacement value $13 million. So they just boil it into the dirt. So this is essentially land value taxation. There's a couple of things that are interesting here. One is 
you can see the modern suburban city over here across the river that is nowhere near the value of the traditional peninsula that is the old settlement pattern. Y'all have this throughout New England. You have these patterns. And it's the modern American city that has figured out the financial system of how to take advantage of the tax system. It's real simple. The more land you waste and the cheaper the building, the lower the taxes I pay your community. Done. And in fact, you can see it here uh, with this development here. This is called new urbanism, which is basically stealing the model of the way that we used to build things before World War II. So this is this building, this this neighborhood was built in the in the 1990s. And you can see the value in the dirt under those buildings compared to its peers, which were built in the same vintage, but in the um the post uh, the, the post-war pattern uh, of development. So uh, finally back to Australia, one of the things that they do there is they they put more value in in the the um in the land, less value in the improvement on top of it. So they're going to get more of your tax bill out of the dirt, less out of the building. And they're going to shift more things to fees is what we would call them in our country, or they call them, uh, uh, they, they have, I think they call it fees in, in there. But um, basically this is the way that it, it stacks out in, in Australia. Well, let me see if this jumps ahead. Um, so you have your rates and your service fees. So you can see that this building right here that has a lower rate on it because it's got a bigger building, but it consumes more services. So it has a higher fee, you know, so they're going to claw back and get their taxes that way. We can think financially out of that system uh, and compensate for the losses when somebody wastes all of the real estate, or if you have a big surface parking lot. Um, so that's, I would just leave you with that example and then um, close with, with a, an example in uh, Leander, Texas, to show you how we visualize solutions uh, the community was doing a tax increment deal for this development. It's about 130 acres of develop, 115 acres of development. They ran a train line out of Austin into the next county over, which is Leander County. I uh, sorry, Leander, Texas, which so is Williamson County. Um, they drop a train station in. They have a university coming in. This developer assembled uh, 115 acres, and he's basically building a traditional New England village of a main street. There's some apartments over here some townhouses, maybe a little bit more dense, more like a little bit more like Boston or Worcester or something like that. Um, and then over the highway over here, there's some boxes. I mean, Texas is growing fast. Now in defense of the community, they grew up in the 19th, they actually incorporated in 1976. So here's how they look next to their cousins. This is Georgetown, which was started in the 1800s. Round Rock is an old place, but here's Leander. They don't have a downtown. They never built a downtown. It's just 100% suburbia. So you can see where their cousins' downtowns are. And what they're doing by building this project is they're essentially starting from scratch and adding a downtown into the middle of no place. Um, so that takes the average value of the city from 275,000 to 500, doubles the value potency of the entire city. And they still have all this other area to grow into if they want, we don't care. So it's their choice. We just wanna show them, this is what you're getting with this deal. Now we had two, elected officials in favor of it, two that were against it, and then the rest were sitting in the middle. And there was, you know, there's a lot of biases that people have. And one of the things that they were saying is this tax increment is a giveaway to their developer. And it's like, well, hold on a second. This is what the tax increment looks like. You're essentially foregoing this light blue triangle, and that money is going to be put in the infrastructure in this area. But the developer is actually paying half the taxes. So you're reducing the tax burden on the developer until they can catch up to their infrastructure. And then it just phases out. And then you all ride this wave into the future. So you're mutually investing in this development. Cities or corporations, you should, right? So just cutting this model at 2025 and just doing it half built, you can see that even half of a project or half built is so much better than everything else around it. So if we fill the thermometer up halfway, now here it is full. Now two of the, the two no votes, we're just like to hell with this. We just want a Costco and a Target and whatever. We're like, all right, fine. Here's your downtown. Here's if you just got your Costco and your Target and whatever. This is what it looks like. So you asked us for our opinion on this. You could get $60 million of development or you could invest 20 in tax as an investment and get 700 million. So do you want 60 or do you want 700? It's your choice. They ended up voting five to two. The two no votes never changed their opinion. I wasn't expecting them to, but when we had a meeting in the break, one of the one of the counselors came down to me 
And she said, you know, Joe, we've been talking about this for almost two years. I never understood it until I saw the purple thing next to the green thing. And I want the purple thing. <laughs> and I said, all right. Now, I mean, think, think about it. You don't have all day to be an economic expert. It doesn't help you if I came in and just dropped a spreadsheet on you, right? So how do you help people understand it? So what do you do from here? One is all of our systems need updating, including our taxation. Moses didn't deliver your tax code. So, so to think about your tax code change, I'll just give you a couple of examples. In Normandy, you used to be taxed on your building footprints. So where your building met the ground was how you were taxed. And that went on for a while until people started projecting the buildings out over the street and buildings would actually meet in the street and catch fire, catch each other on fire. So then they threw the tax system out. In England, you were taxed on the number of windows you had. People started boarding up their windows to avoid taxes. Not a surprise. Hello. In France, you were taxed on your roof line. So people figured out how to put stories up in the roof and call it a mansard roof. And it was a tax loophole. Our tax system does the exact same thing. When you see a strip mall happen, as a developer, there is an incentive for me to waste your real estate because you're not charging me for it. So, so be mindful of that. So our government was set up with this antiquated system. We now have new technology to do this. So use it. So visualize your economic condition, see what's going on, find those leaks. This is why we recommend a model like this. You could do this. Think structurally, think about your systems all through the system. And I just want to give you a little stretch goal to think about. When I, when I look at Vermont, remember I said your counties don't mean anything. So inside your counties, you have dozens, if not you know, multiple times that of, of, of villages and towns inside there. So Chittenden County here, 160,000 people in one county. When we work with other states, we'll, and though here's Windsor County with 57,000. So put it into comparison. This is Colorado at the same scale. Jefferson County, which has Denver, there are 540,000 people in that county. And there is one department inside that county doing property assessment. That would be Jefferson County assessors, not Denver, not uh, Aurora. Not, none of the little towns inside there have their own assessor. One place, one shop. Um, this is Larimer County, which has Fort Collins, 300,000 people live in that county. And here's Mesa County, which uh, which is one of the way Western counties, 150,000. Um, um, drawn a blank, uh, Colorado Springs, or not Colorado Springs, uh, drawn a blank on the name of the city that's out there. We did their analysis. But to float them over your state, you can see that Jefferson covers about two of your counties. Um, uh, Larimer covers almost three. Um, and then this is uh, this is Mesa uh, up there. So think differently about your systems. You should definitely be doing your assessments more than once a year. It was crazy that, that Burlington did it 16 years between assessments. That's not good. Um, communicate transparently. Transparently, we're always going to put the numbers in a visual way that you can see them. I like to joke that we're the Bob Ross of maps. You know, we just like make happy pictures, but but you can see it when it's made clear for you. So you can see those pumps when we show them to you. And then finally, nothing is gonna solve the problem immediately or you wanna test and iterate. So this is a test and iteration. You know, you could choose one or you could choose the other. What are the, what are the positives and negatives of each? So as you go forward and think about land value taxation, uh, if you were to work with us or work with anybody, you wanna see what the unintended consequences are along the way. There's gonna be pros and cons of each thing. And, and that's where I'll close. Thanks for letting me do some math with y'all. Thank you. Representative Odie is like a little beside herself on your beautiful visualization. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> I like pictures. Yes, they're lovely pictures. Um, and sort of didn't realize this would come up today, but we are actually um, spending a bunch of time looking at how we can move our property valuation services to the state level given that we do it differently than anywhere else in the country and that we are a teeny tiny state with just a few people and a few plots of land. Um, so appreciate the validation of yesterday and tomorrow's efforts on that. Thank you. Um, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yes. Um, I think some folks have questions for you, Representative Andrews. Yeah, um, thank you so much for that presentation. It's a little outside of the box of what we've seen in this room so far this session. So it was a lot to think about. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about at the very beginning, I feel like Asheville has a lot of correlations to Vermont. Um, so 
you know, your the downtown shows the, the economic spikes. But I would also posit that if not for the Biltmore and if not for the national park land, which had no spikes, no, no one's going to come to Asheville to see your beautiful downtown. They're there to see the things that had no value, arguably, based on that map. So I guess I wonder how you you think about that from the position of your work. Um, you know, I, I mountain bike. You know, I, I but I I eat food, and the majority of my food is eaten in downtown. When people come here mountain biking, they can't buy a hot dog in the woods or a slice of pizza. So they're they're gonna go to that that urban environment. There is a trade off. Um, I moved here because of that that public land. You know, I'm I'm trained as a city planner. The one thing that I, I used to work in Florida before I moved here, and I know human behavior. Humans will not stop consuming something that doesn't stop them consuming it. If there's no consequences, they'll keep on blowing through their resources. So what's nice about Asheville is our federal government came in and bought up a bunch of land. So we have this value set now that we stay the hell out of that land unless we're recreating or hiking or whatever. So there, there's that is that value set is transferred here. We hold that land sacred, sacrosanct. Now, the unfortunate thing is my county adopted zoning in 2010. Let that wash over you for a second. We didn't have zoning until 2010. This is Appalachia. This is also the South. There is a very strong, uh, you know, Ethan Allen would love us. We're very strong, like, we got property rights. Do whatever you want. It's like, well, hold on a second. There's consequences to you acting on your land. So as long as we all share the fact that that road goes out to your street and you get the great good benefit of driving on it every day, I think you should pay for that. Why should I pay for you to live out where you live? You know, it's just only fair. And when you have that conversation with people here, they're more mindful of that impact. So, you know, I'm not saying that you can't build and we got to go out, build all your parks and not have any public land. It's just understand that that's a value set trade off and you should have parks. You should conserve land. You should, you know, buy down some farms and save that land for agriculture. Once you put asphalt on that land, that's the last crop you're growing. You're going to poison the soil. So we should be mapping the soils to understand where our, where, our, where our fertile soil is and hold that of a higher value. Now you do that through agricultural exemptions and other forms, but that should stay that way. And, and I think in Washington state, there's a clawback that if the farmer ever sells the land to development, the state actually claws back the tax subsidy that they gave it to be a farmer because they're like, look, you, 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 you sullied the promise that we gave you. We wanted this land to be farm you went and sold it, which is great. That's your right. But we want our tax break back. So that, that's another interesting way of doing it. But it's just, you know, I don't want to be punitive about it. It's just understanding the financial calculus of this whole thing. So we already do that here. Um, one interesting part of Vermont's tax system um, is that we actually have a statewide education fund that is funded with our property taxes. Um, so any changes we make to the property tax regime in one community has impacts on everyone else's tax rates statewide because we always need to raise a particular level of revenue from that um, pool. And so when I've heard you describe land value tax, it sounds more like you're talking about taxing all land at the value of its highest best use, not taxing all land at the value of its empty parking lot. And those are two very different things to me. And so I'm curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, there's not going to be a one size fits all. You know, I, I would argue that you start with your investment. Your, you, I, I call it a two drink minimum. You know, what did the community invest in infrastructure? And at a base level, that tax should cover it. So if you do nothing on the land, the cost of the snow plow going by, the cost of the, the, uh, the garbage truck going by, the cost of the replacement value of the road all has to be recouped out of the base value of, of the tax system. That's the simplest way to do it. Now you could turn up the knob in certain areas and say, you have investment zones, you have an expectation of a highest and best use. If the person chooses to not do anything on their land, that's their choice. But we as a community have, have a goal to incentivize growth in this area. And you're just going to, you're, you're paying your fee for not operating with it. Does that make sense? So if, if somebody does a, a, a three-story building, they maximize their density on Main Street with the three-story mixed-use building, or if they put affordable housing in, you could discount their, their, their tax rate 
and recoup it from the ones that are basically wasting the opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, Air, Airbnbs, short-term rentals, those should all be taxed as commercial properties. What we find in state after state, they get, they get valued as residential. There is not a resident in those buildings. Those are tourists. They pay an occupancy tax. It should be valued as a commercial product. Why are we undervaluing that real estate? I mean, there's, there's leaks all over the place. And you know, when, you, when you talk to an assessor, the assessor's like, well, it's a house. It's like it's not being used as a house. It's being used as a hotel room. So when you look at a hotel, does, does a hotel get taxed as an apartment building? No. So we find cities leaking their money all over the place just because of the habits of the assessors. D does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. Thank you, Representative Odie. I wonder if you could talk about rental properties when houses become rental properties, especially around a university, for example, or a state college. Sure. Um, I, I have a, I, I live in a rent, I live in a duplex. I live upstairs and rent out downstairs. Um, I charge a ridiculously reasonable rent for my duplex for the, for the, you know, the guy that lives downstairs beneath me, he's got a little tea shop in downtown. Um, you know, I, I give him a subsidy because I work downtown. It's nice that I've got another downtown business owner. I see him struggle. So it's just like, I, I don't need that extra capital. I could turn around and rent it as an Airbnb and make two and a half times that out of my, out of my revenue right now, my tax doesn't reward me for that. I would argue that my tax should, that if I'm helping solve part of the housing problem in Asheville, I should get a benefit for that. As opposed to right now, my benefit would be, I should just rent it out as Airbnb. It shouldn't just be on me being a nice guy to do this. So I, I think like looking at your economic consequences of housing moving from housing stock to rental stock, okay, for particularly for, like I said, my, my brother was one of those people. He was a renter. New York State resident who lived in to go to Castleton College. So he's got to live somewhere. Now, either the school provides that, or you look at what's going to be the impact inside the private sector market uh, to do that. And there's trade offs. So as that person moves off Castleton campus and into Rutland, that he's going to have an impact and displace somebody in Rutland that needs to work there. That's a trade off. Um, you wouldn't, I wouldn't treat them the same way as somebody that needs to live and work in Rutland. Um, does, does that make sense? Yes. But you can, you can have a, you could have a long-term, a long-term resident rebate or something like that, where somebody that's a live and worker, that's not just a, a temporary resident has a discounted, a discounted tax rate structure. Uh, for the long-term resident or for the owner of the property or both? I would say for the, the, the long-term resident. Now, again, it, it would depend on, we'd have to look at your numbers. It's hard for me to, to see that. You want, you know, that, that individual who's, you know, waiting tables or cleaning uh, a, a restaurant, they're going to have a certain income threshold. That's not, they're not making a lot of money. So if you give that discount, well, you could, if, if the owner is charging a discount. So in, in my case, I'm charging a discount that could float to the owner uh, because my, my tenant is already experiencing a benefit. But if I'm charging market rate and that person has a lower income, that could be an income gap filler for, for the resident. It's going to depend on how it's used. Does that, does that make sense? Yes. Anyone else have a question? Okay. Thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, and oh, wait, thanks sorry. for all the positive comments. Oh, go ahead. We actually have one more, sorry. So it, when I looked at the tax increment financing slide, it, am I wrong to think that you're thinking it's worth it for the investment for the tax increment financing for a, a period of time? Because eventually, you're at, even as you're using tax increment financing, there's a benefit. And then when the tax increment is paid off, you know, paid off the debt, then it's even a bigger help to a city? Uh, sure, yeah. Now, think of it this way, right? Right now, currently, the way that the system is set up, particularly in Leander, Texas, if I go in and just buy the biggest lot possible, put up a, a Walmart, a Walmart is a $50 a square foot building. Walmart is on a, I know that they're illegal in, in your state or complicated in your state, but 
Uh, the Walmart <laughs> They're not is, illegal a here. Walmart? There are lots of Walmarts all over Vermont. <laughs> okay, maybe they used to be, but but it's a Walmart <laughs> is a fifty dollars square foot building. I've actually seen the Walmart real estate expert present at the assessors conference where he presents how crappy they are. Like let that wash <laughs> over you. Now don't don't hate the player, hate the game. That person is very smart to go to the assessors and say we build crappy buildings. And so I went up to the microphone. And I asked him, I said, Mr. Terrell, what's the useful life of a Walmart? And he said, 15, maybe 20 years. We designed the building to depreciate. We move out of it and we'll build another one. So again, don't hate the player, hate the game. They're making a calculated 15-year investment in your community. Now for me to build a stone building with brick and all sorts of beautiful architecture, right out the door, it's going to be more expensive for me as, as a builder. And then I get to pay more taxes for that gift to your community. Right? And I guess so, so in that um, scenario, I would imagine that a community could create a tax increment financing district and put a Walmart in it, and then it wouldn't pay itself. It wouldn't pay for itself, okay. right? So no, it really we, depends yeah, on we, what the development is that occurs in the tax increment yeah, district. We, we saw that in, in North Des Moines, they did that. And I, I asked them, I'm like, are you people high? Like, that's crazy. Because as soon as that tax increment vaporizes, you have a nothing building. You're not getting anything. They gave away the retail taxes, the whole thing. Now, in their defense, they just never thought through it that way because it was pitched to them by the by the Walmart developer. They didn't have anybody double checking the math. So I don't, I don't fault them for that. Oftentimes, we don't get the stuff presented in a way that we understand it. And in their case, they went into it pretty naively. That's why I would argue that at a state level, if you could bring some sophisticated tools to help your communities, um, and we would argue just like help make it see it in a picture. Um, help make it easy for people to understand this stuff. They can make better decisions. You know, when we go to our doctor and they give us a CAT scan or show us an x-ray, it starts to make sense when we see the broken bone. Otherwise, they're just talking like medical gibberish at us. And I, I, don't, I don't know half the terms my doctor uses on me. I don't even know what my blood pressure means. I have to ask them, is that good? And they're like, yeah, you're, you're good. You're good. And I'm like, okay, fine. I don't know what 170 over 20 means. I don't, I don't know any of that stuff. So does that make sense? Yes, Representative Andrews, who actually um, broke her arm yesterday, is, has a question for you. <laughs> you can't see it probably, but here I am. Um, I was just thinking about, you keep me using the Walmart example, and I think people in this room will immediately recognize that a bigger scourge, I think, for Vermont communities is like the family dollar and the dollar general, which also are given opportunities to come in and take our mom and pops out. So I just think I wanted to make that observation. It's, and it, it's the same same principle applies. It's just a smaller footprint. They're not in it for a long haul. They're in it to grow their stock, right? So the more footprint they can put down there is just a stock commodity. Uh, Walgreens and CVSs are the same thing. They're trying to saturate every market possible and then hope that they beat their competition. So Dollar General is in competition with Family Dollar. The two of them are spreading like wildfire through the system because there's capital, people buying stocks in those commodities to grow their, their business. Again, don't hate the player, hate the game. But at a local level, they come in and outcompete your mom and pops. They come in and get charged less taxes for doing that because they're building junkier, crappy buildings. It's just the reality of the tax system. So just being mindful of that, yeah, just we, we've got the same, it's the same principle applies here. We can, we can actually, we're in, uh, in Burlington, we can pull those data, those data points if you want. We've done it for all of Western North Carolina, all the dollar generals here in the 17 county area. It's about the land area size of Delaware that we've done. Um, but yeah, we can, we can share that information with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. And um, I'm sure we'll speak again someday. Thank you. All right, take care. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity to present. And I, I appreciate the comments about the graphics. Uh, we have a wonderful team here doing incredible things. So thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you. Cool.